King of Kings, a title that invokes images of powerful Persian emperors ruling over vast swathes of the Middle East. The title had its origins in ancient Assyria, but by 559 BCE, it had found its home in the Achaemenid Persian Empire under its founder, Cyrus the Great. After Alexander the Great conquered the Achaemenid Empire in the 4th century BCE, the title fell out of use for more than 150 years. The revival of this title would be brought back under a Parthian ruler named Mithridates I in 165 BCE, but would again fall out of use after his death. However, in 140 BCE, a new king of kings was born, not in Parthia or in Persia, but in Armenia. This is Tigranes the Great, King of Kings. Tigranes II, also known as Tigran II, was born in 140 BCE. He was the son of an Alan princess and a king of Armenia, whose name was Tigranes I. He was also the grandson of King Artaxias, the same man that had revolted against the Seleucid Empire to create an independent Armenian state. On top of this, his grandfather also founded a new capital that he named after himself, Artaxata. Tigranes II would grow up here and likely spent his childhood alongside his younger brother, named Goras, as well as his cousin, who was also named Artaxias. Religiously, Tigranes was a follower of Zoroastrianism, a very common religion for that time and place. As he grew from a child and into an adult, Parthian interests in Armenia started to grow as well. In 124 BCE, when Tigranes was only 16, a new king of kings was crowned, and it wasn't him quite yet. There was a new king in Parthia, his name being Mithridates II. Like his grandfather and namesake, he adopted the old Achaemenid title. Now he just needed to find some kings to rule over. He looked north, towards the strategically placed kingdoms in the Caucasus, those being Iberia, Colchis, Caucasus Albania, and largest of all, Armenia. In 120 BCE, he started his invasion. According to Roman sources, King Tigranes I initially made a successful defense, putting up a strong resistance. After this stout defense, Mithridates II would return, this time defeating King Tigranes I. Tigranes I would submit to Parthia, becoming a vassal of Mithridates II, who can now truly call himself a king among kings. To ensure the loyalty of his new Armenian subject, the 20-year-old Prince Tigranes II is taken as a hostage back to the Parthian summer capital named Ecbatana. On top of Armenia, Mithridates II also received the kings of Caucasus Iberia and Caucasus Albania as vassals. On a side note, I find it slightly funny that I have to specify that these two kingdoms are actually in the Caucasus and not in the Balkans or on the Atlantic Ocean. Anyways, Prince Tigranes II would remain as a political hostage in the Parthian court for the next 25 years. In that time, he follows the court from their summer capital of Ecbatana into their winter capital of Tessaphon. Observing and taking notes on the grandeur of the Parthian king of kings. As he grew in age, his influence in the court likely grew until he was a trusted advisor to Mithridates II. In 95 BCE, King Tigranes I would die, leaving his throne in a precarious situation. His son, the 45-year-old hostage Tigranes II, would eventually inherit, after paying the price, of course. Firstly, the daughter of Tigranes II, whom he had with a Parthian woman during his captivity, was to be married to the firstborn son of Mithridates II, a man named Gatarzes, connecting the Artaxiad and Arsacid dynasties. On top of this, the Parthian king also forced Tigranes to cede an area of land called the Seventy Valleys. This would cut Armenia off from the Caspian Sea, but would allow for Tigranes to return to his homeland where he was crowned king in 95 BCE. Now he was the plural tense and king of kings, soon to be joined by three other nearby kings. Following the release of Tigranes II, Mithridates went on another conquering spree. The kingdom of Gordian, on the Armenian border was conquered, along with the kingdoms of Adiaben and Osho-Rion. 
now with the new block of vassal kings and likely a new host of their captive sons, he returned to Parthia. King Tigranes II was not idle, however. Shortly after his return, Tigranes starts planning a campaign. The kingdom of Sofin, to the west of Armenia, had been a long-time rival. Although at first, they were allies during the initial uprising against the Seleucid Empire. The king of Sophene, Zeriadres, was actually the father of King Artaxius of Armenia. After the death of Zeriadres, his other son started to rule Sophene, and this alliance soon broke out into open warfare. These cousin kings continued to butt heads over the next few decades. In 94 BCE, Tigranes deposes his cousin, Artans, and takes over the kingdom of Sophene. It's unknown if Mithridates II gave him permission to do this, or if Tigranes was just showing early signs of his undying ambition. Shortly after this takeover, Tigranes shows more signs of this ambition. He married Cleopatra, the daughter of Mithridates VI of Pontus. Pontus, at this time, ruled over a land known as Lesser Armenia. With this in mind, the marriage makes complete sense. Now he was the son-in-law of a man five years his junior, but even more ambitious than Tigranes. Over the course of their lives, these two men would become the closest of allies. Still, in that same year of 94 BCE, Tigranes deposed another king, one that had no relation to him this time. King Ario Barzines of Cappadocia was his next target. Tigranes invades Cappadocia and sent Ario Barzines running. He then installed a man named Gordius, who was a close confidant of Mithridates of Pontus, on the throne of Cappadocia. Ario Barzines, although deposed and on the run, was still to be feared. He was an ally and friend of none other than Rome, which at this time was a republic that was continuously pushing its boundaries. The furthest east that this republic had managed to push was the province of Cilicia, just south of Cappadocia. At this time, the governor of Cilicia was one of the most influential Romans of all time, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, remembered by many simply as Sulla. In later years, he would become the first Roman to march on Rome itself. But for now, he was on pirate duty, as Cilicia was known as a haven for the Mediterranean pirates. After informing Sulla of the Armenian invasion, he sets off to reinstate Ario Barzines as a king. After a quick campaign, Sulla defeats Tigranes and puts Ario Barzines back on the Cappadocian throne. This brief campaign would be the first time that Tigranes would face a Roman army. After this, Tigranes settles back into his kingship in Armenia for three years. In 91 BCE, the king of kings and his overlord, Mithridates II, dies. We don't even know how he dies, as the later part of his reign and the next half century following his death are referred to as the Parthian Dark Ages, due to the lack of historical sources for this time period. What we do know is that Mithridates would be succeeded by his son, Gotarzes, the son-in-law of Tigranes II. He would take up the more common Parthian title of Great King. One thing we do know about this so-called Dark Age is that it was marked by numerous and near unending civil wars. He wasn't the only regional power locked in a civil war. A year later, in 90 BCE, the son of Tigranes revolted against his father. His name was Zeriadres, and he was likely fighting for the independence of Armenia. Tigranes knew that the time was not right, leaving him fighting for Parthia and against his own son. This father-son civil war is a good time to take a look at the Armenian army composition. The Armenian archers were integral since their legendary founder, Hike the Archer. Parthia, to his south, had a predominantly cavalry-focused force, while Rome, to his west, had mostly infantry-based armies. Tigranes and his own army took a more balanced approach, having very heavy cataphract cavalry alongside his mountaineer infantry in near equal numbers. Zeriadres would meet Tigranes on the battlefield. The civil war would prove to be short-lived. Tigranes would win the battle. His eldest son, 
now lay dead where he had fought. Order had been restored. Armenia was still firmly in the hands of Parthia. But the Parthians were still slowly falling apart from within. Their hold past Armenia started to fade. Iberia and Albania slipped out of Parthian vassalage. To fill this power gap was Tigranes, who, in 90 BCE, installed his cousin that he had grown up with, Artaxias, as king of Iberia. He was already married to the daughter of the previous Iberian king, and after a palace coup, both the Iberians and the Armenians were happy to allow for the rule of Artaxias. Albania's king came to a deal with Tigranes and became his vassal. Now the Armenian king had his very own kings to rule over. With this and his alliance to Mithridates of Pontus, his northern flank was completely secured by the Caucasus mountain range. Over in Cappadocia, tensions were once again boiling over. Tigranes, with Pontic support, reinvades Cappadocia. For the second time, he sends King Ariobarzines running back to Rome for help. A deal between Tigranes and Mithridates was made. The Armenians would take all movable goods, including people, from Cappadocia, while the men of Pontus would take all immovable objects, including the land itself. This time, the Pontic and Armenian aggression would turn the gaze of the entire Roman Republic onto them. Rome sent a legion that reinstated Ariobarzines by 89 BCE. Mithridates of Pontus did not submit after this, but put his foot firmly down on the pedal, as well as on all the necks of every Roman in the Anatolian Peninsula. Mithridates retook Cappadocia, then in the next year of 88 BCE, he orchestrated an extremely well-planned genocide of every single Roman in the Anatolian Peninsula. This would be called the Asiatic Vespers, and in all, 80,000 Romans would be killed or castrated, and Mithridates occupied all of what Rome had owned in Asia, plus parts of Greece. Just when what the Romans would come to call the First Mithridatic War started heating up, Tigranes was forced to abandon his ally. Not really at his own choice, mind you. His Parthian overlord and son-in-law, Gotarzes, had called for his assistance. The Scythians, nomadic horse lords from Central Asia, had invaded the still infighting Parthian Empire. At the same time, the remnants of the once mighty Seleucid Empire invaded Parthia from the west. Under their last half-competent king, Demetrius III Theos, the Seleucids captured the Parthian great king Gotarzes. With his son-in-law now captured, never to be seen again, nothing was holding Tigranes back from abandoning the quickly crumbling Parthian Empire. He returned to Armenia. From July to August of 87 BCE, Halley's Comet was visible in the Armenian sky for an entire month. This was believed to be a sign from the gods, a confirmation for Tigranes to do what his son had tried to do only three years ago. Tigranes was going independent, and he was going to do it in quite possibly the most fitting way. While his reign as a vassal king had started by ceding the Seventy Valleys, the start of his independent reign would begin with a reconquest of the valleys. His armies stormed over the border, taking back the valleys and reconnecting Armenia to the Caspian Sea. Continuing south, Tigranes pushed into Media Atropontine. Here, he installed a king who is now an Armenian vassal instead of a Parthian one. Tigranes and his force kept going, deeper and deeper into Parthian lands. Soon the landscape started to look very familiar to Tigranes. The Parthian summer capital, Ekbatana, was within eyesight. Tigranes had spent a large portion of his captive life behind these walls. Now he stood outside of them, with an army of his fellow countrymen. He would sack Ekbatana in 87 BCE, taking all treasures and captives back to Armenia. Veering west, he installed another two loyal vassal kings, one in Gordion, the other in Adi Aben. Still going west, he decided to conquer the land south of Sophene, known as Asherion. To ensure the safety of these newly captured lands, he then installed his brother, Goros, as the governor of a city called Nisbis. After conquering the majority of northern Parthia, Tigranes returns to Armenia, which was now the seat of an independent and expanding empire. 
By 85 BCE, he starts to use the title of his former captor, Shah and Shah, or King of Kings. On his coins, Haley's Comet can be found, signifying his celestial appointment. Tigranes was the first of very few Armenian men to claim the old Achaemenid title of King of Kings. He always wished to show that he really was a king over kings. According to Roman historian Appian, he never ventured anywhere without at least four subservient kings at his side. He had learned the style of ruling during his Parthian captivity under Mithridates II, but rose to power alongside Mithridates VI. In 85 BCE, the First Mithridatic War came to an end. No borders changed, and the status quo was restored. An uneasy status quo at that. By 85 BCE, the once mighty Seleucid Empire was now a husk of its former self, and confined to only Syria, Phoenicia, and now Cilicia. Through the leadership of Emperor Philip Philadelphus, they managed to keep themselves together. In 83 BCE, this king would die suddenly, leaving his boy king's son as heir. With Rome continuing to push against Seleucid lands, the people of Syria took matters into their own hands. Instead of becoming subject to a child, they instead asked Tigranes to become their new king. He accepted the submission of the Syrians and looked to conquer the last land still controlled by the Seleucids, Phoenicia and Cilicia. Splitting his army to make quick work of the Seleucid remnants, he gave the command of one half to his son, Tigranes the Younger. He retained control of the other half, and together the two Tigranes took the lands, the younger going south to Phoenicia and the elder going west to Cilicia. The Seleucid Empire was now all but dead, although they still controlled a few coastal cities in Syria and Phoenicia. Tigranes was now the inheritor of one of the classical age's final Greek kingdoms. He decided to fully embrace this culture that had invited his rule. Taking many of the Greeks that he had just liberated back to Armenia, he began the construction of a city grand enough to be named after himself, Tigranokerta. This city, located in the center of his realm, was to become a representation of his entire newly created empire. Greek theaters and agoras, alongside Armenian-styled Zoroastrian temples with Parthian worshippers inside. In the Middle East, it is likely that during the time of Tigranes, it was one of the most diverse cities in the region, a seat of power that centralized the Armenian Empire. While the Seleucid conquest and city building was happening, the Second Mithridatic War had just broken out, only two years after the first one. The two allied kings likely supported each other's wars in one way or another. Whereas Tigranes would win his, Mithridates of Pontus was not so lucky. The war only lasted two years from 83 BCE to 81 BCE and would again result in a stalemate and a return to an uneasy status quo. Mithridates did not remain stagnant. Following the conclusion of the Second Mithridatic War, he set his eyes on Colchis, a Georgian kingdom just to the west of King Artaxias of Iberia. As Tigranes had installed his cousin on the Iberian throne, so too would Mithridates install a family member in Colchis. His son, Mithridates the Younger, would rule, stretching the shared Armenian Pontic border even more. In 77 BCE, the influence of King Tigranes the Great had reached its precipice. Without even setting foot in it, the Kingdom of Judea and the city of Jerusalem began offering tribute in the form of money and gifts to Tigranes. Tigranes did not offer protection or vassalage, but he did wish the Judeans the best of luck. They would need it in the coming decades. A year later, while hunting, Tigranes became involved in an accident. He could have died. His condition was uncertain throughout the 64-year-old king's recovery. One of his sons did not care. This son's name is never listed by Roman historians who tell the tale. But apparently, this son preemptively guessed that his father would not recover. He began wearing the crown of the King of Kings in Tigranes' absence. The son had guessed wrong. Tigranes made a full recovery. And now, he had just made a mockery of him. Like Zeriadres, he would also die for disobeying his father. Now, only two sons remained. Only one would remain loyal to his father. 
After his recovery, Tigranes got back to governing his realm that stretched from the Mediterranean to the Caspian Sea. In 74 BCE, his father-in-law would begin the third and final Mithridatic War. After a few defeats, Mithridates faces a Roman army at Kybra. In 72 BCE, he would be defeated by General Lucius Lucinius Lucullus. Mithridates had exhausted his manpower and turned the whole gaze of the Roman Republic onto himself. With nowhere left to recover, run, or hide in Pontus, he ran all the way to Armenia and to the protection of his son-in-law. Pontus and Lesser Armenia would be conquered by General Lucullus, but to win the war and be granted a triumph, he needed the king of poison, dead or alive. In 71 BCE, Lucullus wrote to Tigranes, demanding him to give up Mithridates. Tigranes rejected. Now, this newly built Armenian Empire was destined to face the Roman menace of the Mediterranean. In the spring of 69 BCE, Lucius Lucullus would begin his invasion of Armenia. Perhaps to test this new foe, or his own cavalry, Tigranes sends out a detachment of 3,000 Armenian cataphracts, hoping to scare off the 20,000 Romans and their allies. It did not go well. The Armenian general lay dead where he fought, alongside hundreds of his own men. After hearing of the news, Tigranes leaves his capital to recruit a proper army. The Roman legion, accompanied by Thracian, Galatian, and Bithynian allies, forced march themselves all the way to Tigranicurta in only two months. Tigranes was still out recruiting when Lucullus reached the walls that bore his name. We have no Armenian records for the battle, only Roman ones. Keep this in mind, as I tell you that Tigranes came to relieve the siege with 700,000 fighting men. There probably weren't even this many able-bodied men in the region at this time. It was probably more like 70,000 men, so let's go with that instead. Tigranes approached with 70,000, forcing Lucullus to abandon his siege. He took a defensive position behind the nearby river. He probably couldn't beat Tigranes in a full frontal assault, but he knew that his Roman infantry, which probably only numbered about 3,000, outclassed any of the soldiers that Tigranes could muster. The two armies stared at each other from across the river. No one made a move until the late afternoon of October 6, 69 BCE. The cousin king of Iberia held the Armenian right flank, with the king of Albania holding the left. Tigranes held the center with his most formidable soldiers, the Armenian cataphracts. The battle started with Tigranes ordering his archers to cross the river to get into firing range. At this same time, Lucullus took his Romans and marched them swiftly around the city of Tigranicurta and behind the Armenian army. Tigranes had no idea, as Lucullus hid his 3,000 behind a hill. As Tigranes pushed his army forward, the three separate portions lost cohesion and began, overconfidently and unreformingly, marching towards the river. At this moment, Lucullus sprung his trap, appearing on the hill behind the unorganized and ill-prepared cataphracts. Lucullus charged into the flank of the cataphracts, their heavy weight now slowing them down against the highly organized legion. Soon, the cavalry broke rank and ran, their path blocked by Tigranicurta to the north, the river to the west, and Lucullus in the east. They had no choice but to run south, directly into the rest of the unorganized Armenian army. As the cataphracts ran into the infantry, Tigranes looked in amazement as his 70,000 soldiers were forced on the route by a single legion. He was forced to retreat, leaving his archers abandoned to their fate on the opposite side of the river. Tigranes had lost a second battle to a Roman army. This one was especially embarrassing. As for his recently constructed capital, it would fall to Lucullus as well, but not in a siege. The downfall of his multi-ethnic capital city would be the Greek inhabitants that he had invited and brought to Tigranicurta. After watching the fleeing of their king, the Greeks inside took over Tigranicurta, 
Taking possession of the gates, they invited the Romans in, making sure to point out the Armenian populace inside. Tigranes retreated north to his former capital of Artaxata, gathering another army and combining his force with the man who had brought the Romans here, Mithridates of Pontus. This time, Tigranes had a new strategy in mind. What's the point in formations when you have enough cavalry to outnumber your foe three to one? Charging was the game of the day, always a viable strategy. Lucullus arrived in early 68 BCE after occupying Tigrana Curta. He was met initially by the Iberian cavalry led by the son of Artaxius, a king named Artoses, who was now the second cousin of Tigranes. He was to contend with the Roman cavalry, who only numbered close to 2,000. He would be quickly forced back, retreating in the face of his cousinly overlord. Biting his tongue and praying to his gods, Tigranes sent forth all of his cavalry, with Mithridates doing the same. In a battle with one word for strategy, that being charge, there was only one moment the Armenians could have won, and that was the initial charge. The cataphracts and Pontic cavalry crashed into the lines of Lucullus. After minutes, it was clear the Armenians could not break through the Roman formations. They retreated, and Tigranes was now three for three in regards to his losses against Rome. Unlike last time, Artaxata was not taken, as Lucullus's army mutinied shortly after the battle. Since the beginning of their campaign, Lucullus had marched his men nearly a thousand miles through rough Armenian mountainous terrain, and they had only the loot from a few Pontic cities and Tigranicurta to show for it. This was not much, considering the odds that they constantly went up against. Made even less unfortunate, considering Tigranes took much of his treasury out of Tigranicurta before the Romans captured it. The mutinied men of Lucullus demanded that they go south into the rich lands of Mesopotamia. Here, in a city named Nisbis, the bulk of Tigranes' treasury was moved. The only thing between Lucullus and the regaining of his army's trust was the loyal brother of Tigranes who governed the city, Guras. The city of Nisbis acted as a southern trading city that connected the Armenian Empire to the rest of Mesopotamia through the Tigris River. Goros chose to hold Nisbis as he was put under siege by the men of Lucullus in the winter of 68 BCE. Nisbis had two walls surrounding the city, leaving it a more than defensible spot. It would take more than just a legion for Goros to turn over the city. He held out for nearly a year buying his brother much needed time to gather a new army. The walls of Nisbis only fell to a surprise attack. On a 67 BCE winter night, a terrible rainstorm broke out, giving Lucullus the perfect opportunity. The rain and thunder muffled the fight that broke out on the walls. Not expecting an attack in these conditions, Goros was caught off guard. Nisbis and a huge chunk of the Armenian treasury fell the men of Lucullus, who were, for a very short time, happy with their profit, concluding their mutiny. By the time this off-track siege was over, Mithridates had gathered a fresh army and reclaimed Pontus. Tigranes was working on doing the very same thing in his conquered portions of his empire. Both of these men agreed not to confront Lucullus in a pitched battle. The army of Lucullus promised the same to their commander. When Lucullus made his intentions clear that they were going to retake Pontus, his army mutinied again. This time, they could not be bought off. Altogether, the majority of his men threw their half-full coin purses at the feet of Lucullus. They accused him of only seeking his own glory and not looking after the fortunes of his men. Lucullus was forced to give up and go home, despite his excellent generalship and many victories. While Rome scrambled to find a replacement, Tigranes and Mithridates continued retaking their kingdoms and strengthening their positions. Here, to mop up what Lucullus had nearly completed was none other than Pompey Magnus, otherwise known as Pompey the Great. Tigranes, who had faced off against Sulla three decades ago, would now be forced to face his understudy. By 66 BCE, Pompey had arrived on the Mithridatic front 
he decided to first face Mithridates, marching into Pontus, and eventually catching up to the king in just a few months. On the Lycus River, the two sides would meet. Again, Mithridates would be defeated by the Romans. As he had before, he ran to his Armenian son-in-law, hoping for his protection. After the destruction caused by Lucullus in the previous year, Tigranes had a decision to make. Fight Rome with Mithridates, or go at it alone, and hope the Romans don't invade again. Tigranes went with the latter option, and broke a 30-year-old alliance with his father-in-law. With this, Mithridates fled north, towards the Crimean Peninsula. Some could not disagree with Tigranes' decision to abandon Mithridates more. There, between his father and grandfather, was Tigranes the Younger. Yes, it was time for another one of his sons to betray him. Tigranes the Younger reacted by fleeing east, directly into the kingdom of Parthia. Parthia had only recently started recovering from their dark age, their civil wars and foreign invasions ceasing under the leadership of a usurper in 75 BCE. The usurper was a man named Sinatruces, and when he took the throne, he was already 80 years old. Although he stabilized the empire for a time, his reign was only six years. Directly following this, his son would succeed him in 69 BCE. His name was Parates III. Upon his ascension, he takes the traditional Parthian title of Great King. Not only this, but he also took the same title as Tigranes, King of Kings. Despite this, both Rome and the allied Mithridates and Tigranes tried recruiting him to their respective sides of the Mithridatic Wars. Ferrates III did not choose a side until Tigranes the Younger showed up on his doorstep one day in 66 BCE. The younger Tigranes was seeking to overthrow his father, offering the Parthian king of kings, Adi Aben, if they were successful. Armenia, already cornered by Rome and non-aligned Pontus, was vulnerable. This was a deal that Ferrates just couldn't pass up. He offered the younger Tigranes his daughter's hand in marriage. With his acceptance, the two made their way towards Armenia. Together, they marched through Media Atropatine, finding early success and marching directly to Tigranes the Great. He was behind the walls of his old capital, Artaxata, prepared to receive yet another rebellious son. Artaxata was no easy feat to siege. After nearly a year, Ferrates III would be forced to face his own problems back in Parthia. Leaving Tigranes the Younger with a sizable army, he returns to Tessaphon. Now vulnerable, Tigranes the Elder pounces on the opportunity. Sallying out of Artaxata, Tigranes meets Tigranes in an open battle. The elder Tigranes would win this Parthian-sponsored civil war, his son retreating with his allies. Tigranes the Younger would not return to Parthia with them. Instead, he ventures west, joining the Roman general, Pompey. Tigranes hoped that by abandoning Mithridates, he could delay a Roman invasion as they chased after him. He had miscalculated, not bringing a third rebellious son into that equation. His plan had backfired. Now Pompey began his invasion of Armenia alongside Tigranes the Younger. Pompey marched unopposed to Artaxata, setting up camp and preparing to siege the stronghold. At this point, Tigranes had went three for three against Roman armies, and this was the largest one yet. Instead of fighting, the war-weary King of Kings surrendered to Pompey the Great outside of Artaxata. Alongside Pompey was Tigranes the Younger, who was appointed to rule the Kingdom of Sophene. He was also to succeed Tigranes the Great as King of Armenia upon his death. Tigranes the Elder was forced to give up all of his conquests, keeping only Gordian and the Seventy Valleys. The rest would be split between Rome and Parthia, an action that the Romans would come to regret for decades. Tigranes the Great was also forced to give away huge amounts of his treasury. With his vassal kings gone, Tigranes could no longer call himself King of Kings. Most embarrassing of all, he was forced to become a Roman vassal. He would now start and end his reign as a vassal to a much more powerful country. In exchange for this, he protected his people 
from more war and invasion. Tigranes the Elder would get the last laugh over his son, however. As Pompey marched north towards Mithridates, Tigranes the Younger continued trying to overthrow his father. In 65 BCE, after a few months as king of Sophene, Pompey would return, and he was not happy. Pompey imprisoned Tigranes the Younger and sent him back to Rome where he is never heard from again, likely dying in captivity. The kingdom of Sophene was returned to Tigranes the Great. Pompey returned to chasing Mithridates of Pontus. On the way, he chose to invade the first vassal kingdoms of Tigranes the Great, Iberia and Albania. Iberia was still under the leadership of Artoses, a cousin of Tigranes. This possible point of future resentment was put down by Pompey the Great. At the Battle of Pelorus, Pompey would defeat Artoses, eventually forcing his full submission to Rome. Marching into Albania, he gave similar treatment to their king, Orioses. I think it is likely that in some way, Orioses was related to Tigranes through blood or marriage. Again, all sources for this battle are Roman, and they say that Amazonian women were fighting alongside the Albanians. The Amazonians are a myth. Yet again, this probably means that some women participated in the fighting. In that case, the Albanians gave this battle their all. Despite this, Pompey would surround and kill much of the 60,000, with the huge amount becoming captives. With these two Tigranes aligned kingdoms shown firsthand that Rome was boss, Pompey continued on the manhunt for Mithridates. Recently, the king of poison had taken over his son's kingdom centered around the Crimean Peninsula. When his son refused to help his father, Mithridates had him poisoned. Then, Mithridates took control of the kingdom. One of his other, younger seven sons, then revolted against Mithridates. Soon he defeated him, with nowhere left to run, and Rome, hot on his heels, he had only one option left. In 63 BCE, Mithridates VI Eupador, king of Pontus, committed suicide by poison. Well, at least he tried to poison himself, but he had been microdosing on poison for decades now. His fitting suicide attempt only gave him a stomach ache. He then asked one of his loyal bodyguards to execute him. He obliged, killing his king with a sword. With his death, the Mithridatic Wars had ended, and the grandfather of Tigranes' children was dead. Many point to Mithridates as the main protagonist in the Mithridatic Wars. I mean, just look at the name. While Tigranes acts as something of a loyal ally and sidekick. I believe this needs re-examined to a degree. I feel as though Tigranes could have been the one pulling the strings here. After spending 20 years in a Parthian court, he likely knew a thing or two about diplomacy. Mithridates may have faced Rome single-handedly for a time, but likely wouldn't have had the gall to do it without an ally like Tigranes the Great. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think Tigranes had more of an impact in the Mithridatic Wars than he is given credit for? For 10 years, Tigranes reigned as a peaceful vassal under Rome until his death in 55 BCE at the age of 85. Tigranes represented the greatest territorial expanse that any Armenian king would ever rule over. His empire, stretching from the Caspian and all the way to the Mediterranean. He was part of the final block of Greek versus Roman conflicts. One of the two men who led the Greek coalition, despite being Armenian. In his time, Tigranes would be betrayed by three of his four sons, the final proving to be his downfall. He would be succeeded by his only loyal son, who would become King Artavastes II. Although Tigranes started and ended his reign as a vassal king, for the 20 years in between, he was king of kings, and vassal only to his gods.
Marcus Antonius, better known by the anglicized name of Mark Anthony, is a man who needs no introduction. Julius Caesar's right-hand man, Cleopatra's husband, and Octavian's rival. Simply put, Mark Anthony is a household name, and will remain as such for the foreseeable future. Before anything else, Anthony was a Roman general, and a pretty good one at that. So, the question stands. What is his greatest, standalone victory? The answer is a revenge campaign at the tail end of his most disastrous defeat. This is how Mark Anthony conquered Armenia. To begin, we must first meet the Armenian that Anthony had to defeat. His name was Artavastes and he was born sometime around 100 BC. He was the youngest son of the greatest king in Armenian history, Tigran the Great. His mother was Cleopatra of Pontus, making Artavastes the grandson of the king of poison himself. Mithridates VI Eupator. Over the course of Artavastes' early years, he witnessed as his father created the largest empire in Armenian history, watching as it fell under a Roman invasion. He also saw the downfall of his two older brothers, as they both betrayed Tigran and died a traitor's death. This left the loyal Artavastes, the third-born son, as the inheritor of Armenia. The meaning of his name, perhaps more than anything, can explain his loyalty, as Artavastes translates to preserving through truth. As Artavastes entered his adult years, he was described as a well-educated man, receiving a standard Hellenistic curriculum mixed with Armenian histories. In fact, it was said that Artavastes produced his own scholarly researched historic accounts, although if they existed, they have now been lost. He was also said to have been an accomplished playwright, with those plays also falling victim to time. In 55 BC, Tigran the Great would pass away at 85 years old, after ruling Armenia for 40 years. His title, King of Kings of Armenia, would be passed on to Artavastes, who would now be referred to as Artavastes II. While he was king, Artavastes was also a vassal of Rome, as his father had been for the last 10 years of his reign. Speaking of Rome, shortly after Tigran died, the wealthiest Roman at that time arrived on the doorstep of Armenia, Marcus Licinius Crassus. Better known as just Crassus, the richest man in Rome was one of three men who made the first triumvirate, the other two being Pompey Magnus and Julius Caesar. While those two men had proven their military merit many times over, Crassus had never. He came to the east for one thing, become the first Roman to conquer the Great Parthian Empire. By the next year, Crassus had made all necessary preparations to invade Parthia. In this time, King Artavastes advised the Roman general to travel through Armenia to reach Parthia, also offering him many Armenian heavy cavalry. These two things would lessen Parthia's greatest advantage over the legions their overwhelming cavalry. The route through Armenia was covered in mountains that would offer the Parthian horsemen minimal maneuverability, while the Armenian cataphracts could counter and destroy the lightly armored Parthians. Crassus, always the stubborn man, rejected the Armenian offer. He wanted the conquest of Parthia to be his glory alone. Beginning his march in Syria, he crossed the Tigris River into the flat, and open plains of Mesopotamia. While Crassus was confidently marching on the Parthian heartland, the king of Parthia was on his own campaign. King Orades II invaded Armenia, ensuring that Crassus would be cut off from any support from Artavastes. He conquered Armenia and forced Artavastes to become his vassal. In exchange, Artavastes' sister would marry the heir apparent of Parthia, Pacorus. With Armenia subdued, Crassus continued his march until reaching the plains of Kerhe. Here, his army would be pelted by arrows day and night, as Rome would suffer one of its greatest defeats. 20,000 legionnaires died, including Crassus and his son. 10,000 were captured, and only 5,000 escaped back to Rome and Syria. In comparison, the Parthians only lost a handful of men and horses. 
Back in Armenia, Artavastes and Aurades were celebrating the marriage that would bring their two houses together. The pair were sitting side by side, enjoying one of Artavastes' favorite pastimes, watching a play called the Bacchae. One segment of this Greek tragedy featured a head on display. If the sources can be believed, the prop head was switched out with the head of Crassus. This was a statement to Artavastes. Parthia is mighty enough to defeat Rome, and if you disobey, you will be the next prop in your beloved plays. Artavastes fully understood the very clear message and remained a loyal vassal to Parthia for the next 20 years. In 38 BC, Prince Pacorus, the man who had married Artavastes' sister, died, and this would put Armenian Parthian relations in a strange limbo state as they now had no blood that connected their royal families. In the next year of 37 BC, King Orades would follow his son to the grave. He would be succeeded by his secondborn, King Phraates IV. A year after this, a new Roman emerged in Syria, prepared to succeed where Crassus had blundered. This, of course, was Mark Anthony. The Roman general had undone the name of Artavastes, turning the usually loyal king against the Parthian Empire and onto his side. Anthony's Parthian campaign would start exactly how Artavastes would have wanted it to. The Roman would take the Armenian route through the Taurus Mountains and invade Parthia through their vassal state of Atropatini. The kingdom of Atropatini was home to King Artavastes II's greatest rival and possible relative a king whose name was also Artavastes. The Parthians were completely caught off guard by the Roman invasion from Armenia and were ill-prepared to confront Anthony and his army of 100,000. Artavastes of Atropatini would flee in search of the main Parthian army, while Mark Anthony besieged the city of Frata. While the Romans had successfully invaded Parthia, Mark Anthony forgot to take one thing into account the logistical nightmare it would take to supply 100,000 men over the Taurus Mountains. The man who was tasked with solving this problem would be none other than Artavastes of Armenia. He would have to lead a multiple mile long caravan with assistance from two legions and his own 10,000 man army. The Parthians, never once to miss an easy win, ambushed the caravan with the full weight of their army, forcing Artavastes of Armenia to flee back to his capital of Artaxata. With no supplies or reinforcements coming to the Romans, Mark Anthony decided to call for a retreat back to Armenia. The withdrawal would be costly, as a total of 32,000 legionnaires would perish by Parthian arrows, starvation, or hypothermia. When he finally arrived in Armenia with his tattered army, Anthony made it clear that Artavastes had abandoned him as he had to Crassus, projecting his own loss onto his best ally. After this disaster that in many ways mirrored Crassus, Anthony called his wife, Queen Cleopatra, to send him supplies and a fresh army. After a year of recuperating, Anthony sent a delegation to King Artavastes II in 34 BC. He presented the Armenian king with his son, Alexander Helios, in hopes that Artavastes would marry one of his daughters to the boy. Artavastes rejected, as this could result in Rome turning Armenia into a vassal state once again. After the rejection, Anthony invaded Armenia in early September. Unlike his last campaign, Anthony showed a new level to his military prowess marching on Artaxata and taking the city along with the Armenian royal family as hostages. All this was done in under two weeks. While King Artavastes was Anthony's prisoner, his eldest son, Artaxius, managed to escape. He fled to the enemy of his enemy, King Phraates of Parthia. Mark Anthony didn't wait around to chase down Artaxius. Instead, he quickly turned back to Alexandria, hoping to show off his victory to his beloved Queen of Egypt. Anthony was granted a massive triumphal parade, 
a tradition that was almost exclusively done in the city of Rome up until this point. King Artavastes and his family would be the centerpiece of this procession, the Armenian family being bound together in gold chains and led through the streets until reaching the queen herself. Here, Artavastes was supposed to get on his knees and plead for his life and his throne, where he would then become a vassal of Anthony and Cleopatra. In one final act of defiance, he refused to swear fealty or plead for his life. This he likely did to protect his fleeing son, Artaxius, who knew he would try his best to reclaim Armenia. After this, Artavastes and his family would become prisoners in Alexandria for the rest of their lives. This remained until 31 BC, after the disastrous naval battle of Actium, Anthony and Cleopatra became desperate for allies. They took their captive king, Artavastes, executed him, and sent his head to his namesake rival, Artavastes of Atropatini. Mark Anthony, after the death of Caesar, and after avenging Caesar, had a very unsuccessful military career. However, his Armenian campaign of 34 BC was nothing to scoff at. He conquered a decently sized kingdom in under two weeks. This was surely one of Anthony's greatest hours. Artavastes, on the other hand, led a life of loyalty, watching two disloyal brothers stuck between two seething rivals and finally given the choice of his own freedom or his son's life. Artavastes made all of the right choices for his morals, but politics are no place for the righteous. Artaxius II was born sometime around the mid-first century BC. He was the eldest child of Artavastes II, the king of kings of Armenia. Artaxius was named after his great-grandfather and the founder of the Artaxian dynasty, in which the kingdom of Armenia was revived from Seleucid domination. Not much has survived or been recorded regarding the early life of Artaxius II, but we do know that he had two younger siblings a brother named Tigran, the third of his name, and a sister whose name has been lost, although her impact would prove the finishing touch of the Artaxiad house. Artaxius II most likely had, with lack of a better term, a normal upbringing in the Armenian court, located at Artaxata, a city which bore he and his great-grandfather's name. In 34 BC, the life of the Artaxiad family would change forever, Roman general, Mark Anthony, invaded Armenia and arrived before the walls of Artaxata in under two weeks. Artavastes, with no hope of defeating the Romans, would soon surrender, leaving himself and his family to become hostages of Anthony and Cleopatra. Either on his own accord or on the instructions of his father, Artaxius managed to flee unseen by the Roman besiegers. Exiting Artaxata, he continued east, in the direction of Rome's greatest rival, the Parthian Emperor. After a harrowing journey to Tessaphon, Artaxius arrived at the court of King Phraates IV of Parthia. Informing him of the situation, Phraates was moved by the prince, but even more so, he was excited by a chance to remove Roman influence from his border. While Artaxius was on his way to Tessaphon, his family was on their way to Alexandria. Here they were a centerpiece in a triumph, in which at the end Artaxius' father, Artavastes, was supposed to swear fealty to Anthony and Cleopatra and become their puppet king in Armenia. However, he refused, likely to save the life of the young Artaxius. So, it was destined to be that Artavastes, his wife, and his youngest son, Tigran, were to spend their lives imprisoned in Egypt. For Artavastes, this was quite literally cut short. 
Antony and Cleopatra, desperate for allies after the disastrous naval battle of Actium in 31 BC, took Artavastes' head and gave it to his rival, the king of Atropatini, whose name was also Artavastes. Artavastes of Atropatini was also allowed to conquer a small part of Armenia bordering his kingdom. However, the Egyptian Atropatini alliance was all for naught, as Alexandria fell in 30 BC, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra killing themselves in order to not face humiliation at the hands of Augustus. In place of his two rivals, Augustus took their children, Ptolemy Philadelphus, Alexander Helios, and Cleopatra Selene, back to Rome. Yet another prize, sitting wrapped in chains, was Tigran III, the brother of Artaxius. He also took him back to Rome, and he joined Octavian's many other living political pawns. As Egypt had fallen, so too would Atropatini, although not at the hands of Rome. With Parthian backing, Artaxes moved to take Armenia, the only thing in his way being a few Roman garrisons stationed in his homeland, and his father's rival, Artavastes of Atropatini. Artaxius and the Parthians overran Atropatini with ease, Artavastes being captured and imprisoned in the process. To replace him, King Phraates placed a man named Asinalus on the throne. A mysterious figure, we don't know who his parents were or anything about him up until this point. As evidenced by his coinage, however, I would venture to say that he was a member of the Artaxia dynasty, as his coins look more similar to Armenian ones than Atropatini ones. This is also supported by the fact that Artaxius, the crown prince of Armenia, was allied to and on campaign with the Parthian king. Extending this loyal family's allegiance would have been a smart move for Phraates. From Atropatini, the king of Parthia also restored the Armenian lands that Artavastes I had taken, handing them directly to Artaxius. As the pair marched into Armenia, Artaxius was given the go-ahead to storm his namesake city of Artaxata. Inside the Armenian capital was a Roman garrison, who keep in mind was not supported fully by the locals. After a quick siege, Artaxius and the Parthians broke into the city and followed this up with a massacre of every single Roman inside, even the non-combatants. With his capital restored, it is probably here where Artaxius II is formally crowned as the king of Armenia, although at this point he didn't even control half of that kingdom. After this, Artaxius, his Parthians, and his Armenians went forth to reconquer the rest of his inheritance. At every single city and fort where a Roman garrison was present, Artaxius ordered massacre after massacre of all the Italians. It appeared that the new Armenian king hated Rome, and rightfully so. Rome had betrayed his father's alliance and even killed him. This was a revenge campaign, but the anger didn't cease once it was over. King Artaxius proceeded in hunting down every last Roman, even persecuting native Armenians who had assisted them in any way, even those who had no choice in the matter. This witch hunt would last the entirety of his reign, overshadowing any good he might have done for Armenia, other than reconquering it, that is. While Artaxius had rescued Armenia with help from Parthian muscle and vassalage, there was still one thing that he hadn't reclaimed from Rome, his brother. Not only was Tigran III his little brother, but he was also his primary heir, as Artaxius had no children of his own. Without Tigran, the future of Armenia past Artaxius was uncertain. With this in the back of his mind, Artaxius began sending heartfelt letters to Rome, pleading for Tigran's release. Augustus received these letters, but not before hearing of the cruelty Artaxius had committed against every Roman in Armenia. There was nothing Artaxius could give Augustus that could replace Tigrian's value besides submitting to Roman vassalage, and Artaxius simply could not do that, unless he wanted to be crushed by the same Parthian king who had just helped him. 
Stuck between the future and his present, our taxi is froze, becoming inactive in the middle of two emerging superpowers. Around the same time where Taxis was sending pity letters to Rome, a familiar face appeared in front of Augustus, pleading his own case. This was none other than Artavestes of Atropatini. Somehow, shortly after he was taken hostage, he escaped and swiftly made for Rome. While Augustus was in no place to invade Atropatini and retake it for Artavestes, he did have an opening for him. Just west of Armenia, and on the border of Rome and Armenia, lay the kingdom of Sophene. Sophene, also known as Lesser Armenia, was, as the name suggests, a majority Armenian land, although with more Greek influence, and it was separate from Armenia proper. In the same year that Artavestes was deposed as the king of Atrapatini, he became the king of Sophene. This likely angered Artaxius even more. But he could do nothing, as an invasion of Sophene would mean all of Rome bearing down on him. The status quo of Roman persecution continued indefinitely in Armenia. In 22 BC, the mystery king of Atropatini, Asinalus, passed away. Surprisingly, he was succeeded by the son of Artavestes, the now king of Sophene. His name was Ariobarzanes II and he was ready to continue the increasingly revenge-filled plot shared between Atropatini and Armenia. In 20 BC, the longtime rival of the Artaxiads, Artavestes, the king of Sophene, would pass away at 39, after ruling as a king in two separate countries for 33 of those years. As for the fate of Sophene, we do not know who the next king was, but it did linger as an independent entity for the next 37 years, possibly under a younger son of Artavestes. Artaxius, for his one achievement of reclaiming Armenia, was not a good king to his people. He never forgot about the Roman betrayal and continued persecuting Armenians even a decade after he retook his homeland. The nobility of Armenia became ever more worried by this, as some of them were forced into helping their invader. With no sign of Artaxius' anger simmering anytime soon, many of the nobles gathered to discuss options. They came to a bleak conclusion. The only way to get rid of Artaxius was to somehow get his brother back in Armenia. And the only way to do that was to let Rome back into Armenia. So, the nobles wrote to Augustus, describing their situation and promising to let Tigran III rule as a Roman vassal. All the emperor had to do was deliver him to them. The nobles would do the rest. Summoning a large army to escort Tigran, Augustus entrusted the legions to his adopted son, the future emperor, Tiberius. Taking passage by boat and landing somewhere in the Levant, likely Antioch, the legions set out in the direction of Armenia. They weren't even halfway there when they got the news. The nobility of Armenia did their part and took care of their tyrant, convincing one of Artaxias' servants onto their side. He killed the king by means of dagger. Tigran III of Armenia was likely born sometime around 40 BC. He was the second-born spare of King Artavasis II of Armenia, his elder brother being named Artaxius II. Nothing has survived regarding the formative years of Tigran III, so we will skip right ahead to where his story truly begins. In 34 BC, when Tigran was likely still only a boy, his father's capital city of Artaxata came under siege, the invader being none other than Armenia's erstwhile ally, Roman general Mark Anthony. The walls of the old capital held out long enough for Tigran's brother, Artaxius, to make a daring escape into Parthia. 
Meanwhile, with no hope of defeating the Romans, Artavasis II surrendered to his one-time ally, who took him and his family back to Alexandria as hostages. Upon entering the city of the Pharaoh, the Artaxid family was led through the streets in a triumphal procession. King Artavastes was supposed to submit to Cleopatra and Anthony as their vassal. However, to protect his on-the-run son, Artaxius, Artavastes rejected and chose a life behind bars instead. A few years later, this choice would pay off as Artaxius II reclaimed Armenia from the Romans and became king in place of his father. Just a few months after that, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra became desperate for allies, as Octavian and Agrippa pushed their advantage. The rulers of the Eastern Mediterranean needed manpower and allies more than anything else. They found an easy one in their captive king's greatest nemesis. In 31 BCE, Artavastes of Armenia was executed and his head was sent to the kingdom of Atrebatini for their support. Tigran likely watched this execution. While the alliance to Atrapatini did supply some much-needed support, it was already a lost cause. Octavian and Agrippa defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, as the power couple chose suicide rather than an embarrassing triumph as they had done to their Armenian hostages. In place of his rivals, Octavian took their children with him back to Rome. Not only these children, but also another. Sitting hostage and looking much like a present to Octavian was the teenage prince of Armenia, Tigran III. He would also be brought back to Rome as an honored hostage, where he would join the other captive king and princes of Rome's many satellite states. His time in Rome would be very influential, as it was his first time in four years where Tigran would be treated less like a prisoner and more like royalty. On top of the Armenian and Egyptian educations that he had already received in his boyhood, Tigran also got a Roman education in his teenage and early adult years. All in all, Tigran would spend 10 years in Rome, likely most if not all of his 20s. In this time, Tigran's brother, Artaxius II, the now king of Armenia, was becoming something of a tyrant. Over the course of his 10-year rule, he ruthlessly persecuted the Romans who had betrayed him. Upon forcefully entering Armenia, he slayed garrison after garrison of Romans, sparing none. Then, when all the Romans ran out, he began executing native Armenians who had helped the Romans, even those who were forced to, and even the Armenian nobility. This continued for 10 years, until the nobility, fearful of their childless king, looked to the only man that could save them the Crown Prince of Armenia, Tigran III. After a meeting of the aristocracy, the Armenians decided to ditch their Parthian-backed tyrant king in exchange for a Roman-backed king who hadn't set foot in Armenia for 15 years. The nobles wrote to Roman Emperor Augustus, pledging their support for Tigran III and Rome. All he had to do was deliver Tigran. They would do the rest. Augustus sent Prince Tigran, along with his heir, Tiberius, in the direction of Armenia. Before they could even see the mountains, King Artaxius was dead, assassinated at the hands of the Armenian nobles. Tigran III walked into Armenia, the only remaining male member of the Artaxia dynasty. Accompanied by Tiberius and the Armenian nobility, Tigran made his way to Artaxata a city bearing his brother's name. It is probably here where the coronation ceremony of King Tigran III took place. Armenia had a new king. Not only this, but also a new overlord. Trading the Parthians who mistreated Armenia in no serious manner for Rome, an empire nearly as land-hungry as Tigran the Great. Despite this, Rome was definitely the stronger of the two options for Armenia to side with. Of course, with Tigran III being a Roman hostage, there wasn't really any choice in the matter of who their overlord would be. Being allied to Rome brought its own sets of advantages, such as in trade and military protection. But one vital thing that Parthia had that Rome didn't at this time was a civil war. 
While Parthia was eating itself alive in civil strife, Rome had only just entered the golden age of stability that was the Pax Romana. For Armenia, this meant complete peace and stability for the first time in over two decades. Tigran, in stark contrast to his brother, was widely regarded as a good and just king who simply wished to rule his realm peacefully. Although Tigran entered Armenia as the last of the Artaxiads, it didn't stay that way for long. A short time after entering Armenia, Tigran III would marry. The woman in question is unknown, but we can make a few assumptions that she was either handpicked by Augustus, the daughter of a powerful Armenian noble, or perhaps an Artaxiad from the sister branch of the family that used to rule Caucasus Siberia. Whoever she was, she would give Tigran III his first son and by extension save the Artaxia dynasty from a race. He would take his father's name and be known as Tigran IV, the crown prince of Armenia. Tigran III, like many Armenian kings, practiced polygamy and took on another wife. Again, we don't know who she was, but we can follow the same criteria and perhaps even overlap it with the assumptions about the origins of his first wife. Shortly after the birth of his son, Tigran III would welcome a daughter into the world by his second wife. She was named Aratu, which means peak or summit in Armenian. Indeed, she would be the peak queen in all of Armenian history. But I'm getting ahead of myself. With Tigran III's ascension, Armenia was firmly in the hands of Rome. Most nobles desired this as a favorable position, but some still remembered the times of Parthian vassalage and Roman betrayal. Even those who did not had a soft spot for Parthia as they had more in common with them than the Romans who came from a sea away. Even some still wanted an independent Armenia. However, this was far from a possibility. In 8 BC, after ruling Armenia completely peacefully for 12 years, King Tigran III died. We aren't sure about his cause of death, although we do know that he died rather young most definitely before his 50th birthday. Succeeding him was his children, who would both become important in their own time. Many queens in Armenian history have shown that they are just as competent, if not more, than their kingly counterparts. Perhaps no one else stands as tall among these strong female rulers more than Aratu Artaxiad, the last of her dynasty and the three-time queen of Armenia. Her story is one of repeated rise and fall that ultimately saw her become the national pride of a country that only wanted to rip itself apart. Aratu started life as a princess, being born to the Armenian king, Tigran III, sometime around 20 BC. Her mother's name remains a mystery, although we do know that she was the second of Tigran's two wives. Shortly before the birth of Aratu, the king's first wife gave birth to her slightly older half-brother, taking his father's name of Tigran. The two royal children were brought up in ancient Armenia's capital city of Artaxata. Here, they would have received a royal education consisting of Hellenistic and Armenian studies that would have primed them for their future roles as monarchs. Over the course of their childhood, Armenia was in a state of complete peace, in contrast to the decades previous where external chaos had plagued the nation. Their father, Tigran III, was a just ruler who was loved by his people. Well, most of them. But that problem would fall to his children as Tigran III died a young man in 8 BC, leaving two adolescents at the head of an Armenia that was ready to erupt. In a normal Artaxiad enthronement, the first to become king was the eldest son of that previous king, but this was no normal succession. For starters, the siblings weren't even adults yet. For conclusions, they were both the last two members of the main Artaxiad dynasty that had ruled Armenia for nearly 200 years. Together, these two things would lead to the marriage of the royal half-siblings, 
This is, of course, incest and is terribly frowned upon today, but for the ancient world of the Middle East, this was not out of the ordinary. Keeping the royal blood pure was a top priority in antiquity. It's unknown if they were married before their rise to monarchy, but it was likely something that was already planned in the life of Tigran III. Most Armenians were elated that they had not only one, but two Artaxiads ruling over them. Their marriage symbolized the continued peace and prosperity that Armenia had enjoyed during the reign of their father. Tigran IV and Aratsu are unique in the way that they were equals. She was an autocrat in the same way that her brother was, and on both of their council, they would rule Armenia. However, at the point of their coronation in 8 BC, the siblings were too young to rule without a regency. This could have fallen to a council of nobles, or perhaps one or both mothers of the dual monarchs. Much like the monarchy, Armenia was split in quite a few ways. Firstly, their country had been split between their two largest neighbors, Rome and Parthia, ever since the final years of Tigran the Great some 50 years ago. The two great powers tussled for the vassalization of the Artaxiads. However, at this point, Augustus had been the overlord of Armenia since Tigran III came to power in 20 BC. This external power jockeying caused a crisis of character for the Armenian people. The nobility was split on who they favored, with pro-Parthian and pro-Roman factions emerging as adversaries. Even still, there was a persistence among the common folk to secure the independence of Armenia. This would have been nearly impossible at this time, but the rising Armenian nationalist group was perhaps too proud to think otherwise. While the enthronement of Aratu and Tigran was well received in Armenia, the same cannot be said in Rome. For Augustus, his Armenian subjects had chosen their rulers without his permission. This wouldn't have been a problem, but the half-siblings were not Augustus's picks for the throne. Although they were the last remaining members of the main Artaxiad branch, they were not the only contenders. Sitting in Rome, patiently waiting for his turn, was a man named Artavastes. Not much is known about Artavastes. We don't even know who his parents were, but we do know that he was a member of the Armenian royal family, likely a cousin of the sibling monarchs. My theory of Artavastes' origins plants him as a descendant of Tigran the Great's younger brother, Guras, although any evidence corroborating this does not exist. Another, perhaps more believable theory is that his mother was an Artaxiad princess who was given to Augustus that he promptly married to one of his allies. Enthroning Artavastes would be a surefire bet. As far as we can tell, he was likely raised in Rome and around the emperor himself, making him a valuable ally if he was to become the Armenian king. Artavastes as king would also split the Artaxiad family and split Armenia further than it already was. This would benefit Rome, as keeping the Artaxiads weak would leave them to become ever more powerless and ensure continued cooperation with the Roman Empire. Removing two monarchs and handpicking one would have also been a power play by Augustus, showing who was really in charge. While Augustus preferred Artavastes as king, the matter was put aside for the time, as Aratu and Tigran IV proved to be nothing less than loyal. They sent gifts to the Eternal City and its Emperor, showing that they were more than willing to continue the status quo. For three years, the siblings continued ruling Armenia as a peaceful Roman vassal. In 5 BC, Augustus finally got around to the Armenian question. As Armenia grew stronger under their continued peace, it soon became a threat at the frontier of the Roman Empire. Worried that Armenia may split from Rome and side with Parthia once more, Augustus took the initiative and sent his Artaxiad puppet, Artavastes, to the court of Artaxata. It's unknown if Augustus sent Artavastes with an army or simply diplomats, but the result would be all the same. Aratu and Tigran IV were overthrown, and a new sole king of Armenia was crowned in 5 BC, in the form of Artavastes III. And just as all deposed Artaxiads do, they turned to the enemy of their enemy for aid. This time, it was the Parthian Empire. King Artavastes III proved to be an unpopular pick among the Armenians, 
Where the Roman, Parthian, and Armenian factions were satisfied with the sibling monarchs, only the pro-Roman party were pleased with Augustus's pick. A note should be made here on the coinage of Artavastes III. The new king's coins echoed Roman influence. Artavastes is depicted less like an Armenian king and more like a Roman emperor. Of course, he still sported the double eagle crown, but his facial features looked more Latin than Artaxiad. This may have been the truth of his face, but these coins represented the attempted Romanization of Armenia. While Artavastes III minted his coins, the usurped monarchs found themselves in the court of Phraates IV, Emperor of Parthia. At this point in 5 BC, Phraates had ruled Parthia for the last 32 years as both Mark Anthony and Augustus's most powerful rival. The Parthian emperor even assisted Aratsu and Tigran's uncle, Artaxes II, to reclaim his throne. In his early years, Phraates would jump on any opportunity to oppose Roman influence, but as the empire became ever more consolidated and powerful under Augustus, Phraates became more reluctant to avoid a total war with Rome. Instead of directly supporting the deposed monarchs with an army, Phraates took a more subtle approach. The Parthian emperor monetarily supported Aratu and Tigran, who would use this money to bribe more members of the pro-Parthian faction onto their side. After three years of exile in Parthia, the dual monarchs, now of age to rule Armenia without the need of a regent, were ready to make their return. In 2 BC, likely at the head of an army, Tigran and Aratu overthrew their cousin and reclaimed their throne. Artavastes III had failed to win over the Armenians, as his three-year reign was mostly spent in the palace. The deposed king would therefore be exiled where he likely returned to a displeased Augustus in Rome. Following this, Artavastes' fate is unknown, as he disappeared from the historical record. With their throne reclaimed, Phraates IV, not wanting to start another war with Rome, withdrew all Parthian support for Armenia. This was one of his final actions, as he would die soon after the siblings reclaimed their seat of power. Aratu and Tigran IV had just forcefully overthrown a Roman ally. They were now in threat of triggering a war with the hegemon of the Mediterranean. Instead of declaring independence as one might expect, the siblings wrote to Augustus, sending gifts and pledging their continued support as a vassal of the Roman Empire. Reluctantly, Augustus agreed to support the otherwise loyal monarchs. With Aratu and Tigran reclaiming their thrones at the head of an army, the 18-year streak of peace in Armenia was finally shattered. This would prove to be the breaking point for the growing factionalism that had consumed Armenia over that time. The pro-Parthian party that helped Aratu and Tigran reclaim their throne were disgruntled with their continued support for Rome. In the east, they gathered an army, intent on opposing Augustus and the Artaxiad siblings. Tigran IV, now an adult, assembled his own army and rode to confront his old allies. The young king of Armenia, who had grown up in utter peace, was inexperienced in the art of war. While the pro-Parthian faction of nobles had been trading blows with Rome for decades. In 1 AD, the armies would clash in a battle that would decide the fate of Armenia. There are no records about this engagement or where it even took place, but the result would see the 20-year-old Tigran IV defeated and dead. With half of the twin monarchy gone, Tigran left an even younger Iratu, widowed and alone, all while she still carried their unborn child. As the army that had killed the king approached Artaxata, Aratu gave no resistance and willingly abdicated her throne. Hereafter, the pregnant queen likely made her way to Rome, possibly reuniting with her cousin, Artavasis III, who probably found amusement in seeing the queen who had exiled him be exiled herself. Sometime during or after the long journey to Rome, Aratu gave birth to a daughter. Unfortunately, her name has been lost, but this baby was the last to ever be born as a true Artaxiad. 
Although we don't know her name, we do know who this child eventually married. She would wed the king of Iberia, Faras Menes, a land neighboring Armenia that the Artaxiad had once ruled over themselves. The couple would go on to have three sons, with the eldest of these three children, Radamistus, proving to be a psychotic ruler who would invade and subject Armenia to his cruel reign. I made a video about him linked here, if you'd like to check that out. Now, back to the story at hand. With Queen Aratu exiled and King Tigran IV dead, the pro-Parthian faction emerged at the head of a kingless Armenia. The new council of ruling nobles wrote to Parthia, seeking their overlordship as planned. However, with the Roman Empire on the rise, Parthia's days of defeating legions was numbered. The Armenians found no support from the Parthians that they had just fought a war over. Augustus was still very much so in charge. He just needed to find a ruler that all Armenians would be happy to call their king. To compromise with the pro-Parthian faction, Augustus appointed the neighboring ruler of Atrapatini, Aryobarzanes II, as the king of Armenia. Aryobarzanes was likely a distant relative of the Artaxiads, but most importantly, he was also related to the Arsacid dynasty of kings that ruled over the Parthian Empire. Having someone who could claim descent from Armenia and Parthia would surely quell the situation. What Augustus had failed to calculate was the long memory of the Armenians. Since the reign of Tigran the Great, Armenia and Atropatini were sworn enemies. Even the suggestion of this enthronement was enough for the splintered Armenian factions to find common ground and unite. Together, they weren't just fighting for Rome or Parthia, but for the independence of Armenia itself, finding a strong leader in the form of an inspiring general named Abaddon. Seeing that the Armenians were less than willing to give up their independence for the first time in 60 years, Augustus sent an army in the direction of Armenia. These legions were led by one of the many heirs of Augustus, his grandson, Gaius Caesar. With their armies combined, Aryobarzanes of Atropatini and Gaius Caesar marched into a hostile Armenia. The rebel stronghold was a city in the far east named Artagira. But before reaching the city, the pair first had to contend with the guerrilla warriors in the mountains of the Lesser Caucasus. This they did in good time, reaching Artagira sometime in 2 AD. A siege would ensue for some time before Abaddon finally decided to give up his fight. Running low on provisions, he invited Gaius Caesar into his stronghold to discuss peace. Sometime after entering the fort, with his bodyguard in tow, Abaddon made the signal, and the Armenians closed the gates, pouncing on the Romans. Gaius Caesar was wounded in the brief engagement that ended with his small retinue fighting their way out of the fort, carrying their general out of Artagira with them. Gaius survived the ambush and returned to his camp. Handing command to one of his officers, he ordered for the siege to continue. After a bloody fight, the Romans took Artagira soon after. Showing no mercy after Abaddon's treachery, they killed him and every Armenian nationalist inside. With their leader dead, the task of pacifying Armenia was relatively easy, and complete by 3 AD. With Rome firmly in control of Armenia, Aryobarzanes was formally crowned as king. Showing his dominance over the nationalists, he made his capital of both kingdoms at the city of Artagira. Concluding the Armenian campaign, Gaius Caesar began his journey back to Rome but he would never lay eyes on the city again. His wound was more serious than anticipated, and he died in the early days of 4 AD, one of the many heirs of Augustus who died before his time. The Armenians may have lost the war, but they would get the last laugh. This time, the next time, and even the time after that. While the Armenian nationalists had been defeated, they were not yet subdued going into hiding in the mountains, or simply in plain sight. In 4 AD, after only a year of ruling Armenia, 
King Aryo Barzanes was assassinated by them. His succession was followed by his son, a man named Artavastes, the fourth king of his name to rule in Armenia, and the second of his name in Atropatini. This, however, only served to raise the nationalist fervor, and just like his father, he was assassinated in 6 AD, only ruling for two years. For Atropatini, this was the last king that they could give to the Romans. Shortly after the assassination of Artavastes, a tribe of nomads known as the Dahe took the opportunity to conquer Atropatini and name their leader, Artabanus, as the new king. With a dead grandson, two exiled monarchs, and two dead kings, Augustus finally relented. At this point, he had little other options than to compromise with the Armenian nationalists. He knew that if he wanted to keep Armenia as a vassal, then he needed to let them be ruled by one of their own. Or perhaps, two of their own. Augustus picked the new king of Armenia, a man unsurprisingly named Tigran the fifth of his name to rule Armenia. Tigran was a member of the Jewish Herodian dynasty, his grandfather being King Herod himself. Tigran's grandmother was an Artaxiad princess and the daughter of King Artavastes II of Armenia. Tigran V was born in 16 BC and raised in Herodian Jerusalem. When Tigran was only nine, his father, the future king of Judea, Alexander Herod, was assassinated on the orders of his own father, Herod the Great. Hereafter, Tigran would remain in Jerusalem, bearing witness to his grandfather's growing paranoia, especially in regard to a baby born in Bethlehem. When King Herod died, Tigran left Judea and made way to the court of his other grandfather, King Archelaus of Cappadocia. Finally free of Herod's captivity, Tigran despised him so much that he renounced his Jewish religion and chose to embrace his Hellenistic roots in Armenian name. He remained in Cappadocia for some time until he was sent to Rome for education, thus leaving another Armenian heir in the palms of Augustus. Following the death of both Atropatini kings in 6 AD, Augustus sent Tigran to Armenia along with an army and another one of his heirs this one being the future emperor, Tiberius. On the way to Armenia, the Roman army made a pit stop in Cappadocia to pick up King Archelaus, who would accompany his grandson to Armenia. The Armenian nationalists finally put down their weapons, as a descendant and namesake of Tigran the Great was once again ruling over them. Tigran V was escorted to Artax Auto, which he renamed as the capital. Soon after, he was crowned as the king of Armenia. The nationalists were finally happy with Augustus's pick, but they were not wholly satisfied. While Tigran had Artaxiad blood in his veins, he was a Herodian by birth. The Armenians agreed to accept Tigran V, but only if he reigned side by side with the true Artaxiad queen, Aratu. Aratu made her way from Rome and joined Tigran V at Artaxata, where, for the third time in her life, she was named as the Queen of Armenia. While there is no evidence that Tigran V and Aratu married, they most likely did, to appease the Armenian people. Armenia was once again ruled over by a King Tigran and the same Queen Aratu. With this, the nationalist revolt stopped, and Armenia returned to the long peace that was enjoyed during the queen's first reign. As before, the dual monarchs held equal power in their kingdom. However, it appeared that Aratu took the driver's seat in their shared rule. After all, Tigran V had never set foot in Armenia before this time. Queen Aratu did her best to restore the prosperity Armenia had enjoyed during her childhood. She was a patron of the arts and funded the reconstruction of many of the buildings and temples that were destroyed during the years of chaos. The coins issued during her third reign would feature the beautiful Aratu on one side with the dual peaks of Mount Ararat on the other. These twin peaks are the most important mountains in Armenian history, 
holding a cultural significance even before they became synonymous with the proposed landing place of Noah's Ark. The two mountaintops also represented the dual reign of the Armenian monarchs. These coins are a stark contrast to the coins of Artavasides III, who issued his in a more Roman fashion. This helped maintain the Armenian culture, even when under a Roman overlord. During her third reign, Queen Aratu's biggest contribution was her simple existence. As long as she was queen, peace could be maintained. She was somebody that Rome and Parthia could respect, but most importantly, she was loved by her people. While Armenia was undergoing a period of healing, trouble was brewing in the east. In 12 AD, the king of Atropatini, Artabanus, invaded Parthia and became their new emperor. The deposed Parthian king, Venones, had little option left of where to continue his resistance. He wisely chose a land where Atropatini was public enemy number one. This was, of course, Armenia. In 12 AD, Venones entered Armenia and overthrew Tigran and Aratu, sending the queen into her third and final exile from her homeland. After six years of rule, the age of Tigran V and Queen Aratu was over. Tigran likely returned to his grandfather's court in Cappadocia, where he lived for many years until he fell victim to the paranoia of the man who had brought him to Armenia in the first place, the now emperor, Tiberius. As for Aratu, her life after 12 AD is a mystery, but I'd like to think she joined her daughter in the kingdom of Iberia, where she instilled within her eldest grandson, Radamistus, an undying urge to retake Armenia for their family, at all cost. Queen Aratu's three separate reigns represented the bleak future ahead of Armenia. As Romans and Parthians fought over her homeland, they would continue doing so for the next 50 years, as Armenia became a battleground between the two burgeoning empires. The last Artaxiad to rule Armenia would also happen to be the only queen to ever rule Armenia as a true monarch. This, in itself, should be celebrated. The 200-year reign of the Artaxia dynasty was a golden age that gave rise to some of classical Armenia's greatest rulers. From its founder, Artaxius, who quite literally set ancient Armenia's boundaries in stone pillars, to his grandson Tigran the Great, who pushed far past those pillars and led Armenia into empire, where its territorial zenith would never come close to being matched. While Tigran saw the rise of his empire, he also bore witness to its fall at the hands of Rome, the same Rome who would kill his loyal son, Artavastes, and plunge Armenia into chaos. When the dust settled, there was but one Artaxid left, the standalone queen in Armenian history, Aratu. And just as she stood alone, so too does the history of the Armenians, all the way to the present day. I want to give a huge thank you to my first two patrons, Derek Clark and Savak Leo Nazarian, who both joined my Patreon on November 27th. If you'd like to support this stoic historian, then please feel free to do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or become a YouTube channel member like Donald Vincent or Derek Clark once again. Thank you again for your generosity.